Workers leaving the Le Maire factory was the very first motion picture ever to be screened. Shot by brothers Augusta and Louis Le Maire in 1895, the movie is just what its title suggests, 47 seconds of black and white footage capturing factory employees leaving work for the day. Pretty exciting. To get from workers leaving a factory to astronauts spinning in space took the vision and creativity of a whole slew of engineers, inventors, cinematographers, directors, screenwriters, and actors. And here are four films that change filmmaking. Who says propaganda is a bad thing? This little piece of cinema history was created to pay tribute to early Russian revolutionaries, but what it did was wind up overthrowing the way dramatic films were made altogether. The silent movie tells the tale of a 1905 uprising in which Russian sailors thwart tyranny aboard a ship, only to be laid to waste when heavy-handed bad guys, in this case Cossacks, come looking for retribution. The story unfolds in five acts. The Odessa Steps is easily the most notable of the five, hailed by filmmakers, scholars, and movie buffs as an important breakthrough in the art of editing. Sergei Eisenstein was one of the very first directors to use montage, editing a series of shots into one sequence, as he captured the climactic destruction that occurs when the Cossacks invade the town, weaving together the fates of various townspeople and one very unlucky baby in a carriage. And that scene was reprised very famously in 1987's The Untouchables, as well as many other movies. Very famous scene. Battleship Potankin was banned in several countries, including, ironically, the Soviet Union in the Stalinist era. Joseph Stalin feared it might incite a riot against his repressive regime. He may have been right. Toot, 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 toot. Goodbye. Toot, 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 toot. Don't cry. The Jazz Singer was the first film to break cinema's sound barrier, charting new ground by adding spoken dialogue to a movie production. That breakthrough was good enough to earn the movie the very first Honorary Academy Award for Technical Achievement. Warner Brothers Studios used what was then a spanking new technology called the Vitaphone. The sound on disc system required a projectionist to sync film reels to a phonograph record to play recorded dialogue and tunes, and it actually worked. It was an unsteady but very important first step. The Vitaphone songs and some dialogue have been introduced most adroitly. This is what was said by a New York Times reporter in 1927 when reviewing the film. This in itself is an ambitious move, for in the expression of song, the Vitaphone vitalizes the production enormously. See what he did there? Although Vitaphone and similar technologies were soon replaced by sound on film, which was a pretty good idea, it continued to be used for Looney Tunes and other cartoon pictures throughout the 1940s. If you haven't seen Baz Luhrmann's flashy interpretation of The Great Gatsby, don't do it. Instead, spend a couple of hours with Citizen Kane, right? A more gratifying story of the perils of the American dream that was loosely based on the Gatsby book. Often at the top of the list for the best movie ever made, Citizen Kane tells the story of a publishing tycoon's ill-fated quest for glory. Also, something about a rosebud. Written by Orson Welles and Herman Mankiewicz, the movie's central figure is an approximation of real-life media giant William Randolph Hearst. Wells also directed and stars in the cinematic masterpiece that set the bar for movies a couple of notches higher. It embraced a time-distorted narrative, it used lighting to capture mood, and relied on deep focus shots in which the entire frame of each shot remains in focus at all times to let viewers search the screen for the answer to the rosebud riddle. Pretty ingenious. My hat is off to you, sir. Disciples of film, auteurs like Wes Anderson and Quentin Tarantino, might want to spend some time paying their respects to Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut. These titans of the French New Wave set the course for their American offspring with a smattering of self-aware films that use new techniques to tell old stories. The French New Wave has influenced all filmmakers who have worked since, whether they saw the films or not. And this is what Martin Scorsese once said. It submerged cinema like a tidal wave. The centerpiece of the New Wave movement, Breathless, is best known among cinephiles for its extensive use of jump cut editing. Director Godard used multiple shots of the same subject from slightly different angles to express the passage of time. 
The technique also gives the film an edgy, jagged feel as Godard tells the story of an outlaw, played by Jean-Paul Belmondo, and his love interest, Jean Seberg, on the move. Jump cuts have since become a regularly used way to build tension in cinema. Gangster movie fans might recall that Scorsese employed the very same technique in the closing scene of Goodfellas as the cocaine-addled Henry Hill drives around Brooklyn and the cops closing in by helicopter. Great scene, great use of jump cuts. Italian film icon Federico Fellini weaves the maybe autobiographical story of a harried director who's having some trouble getting his latest project on course through a series of surreal dream fantasy and present day scenes that blend one into another, leaving the viewers that task for sorting out which is which. Eight and a Half opens with a dream sequence that includes director Guido stuck in impenetrable traffic, struggling to get out of his car, and then floating toward the clouds before being pulled back down to earth by a rope tied to his ankle. Guido is going everywhere in his mind while his film project chases his own tail. I'd say it's probably autobiographical. The title of the film, by the way, comes from the fact that it was the eighth and a half film that Fellini had directed or co-directed. It opened the door for generations of surrealist movie makers, including no less than David Lynch, Terry Gilliam, Darren Aronofsky, and Michel Gondry. So maybe if you're bored on a Friday night, try following Eight and a Half with Aronofsky's Black Swan or maybe Gondry's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and you'll really be able to see the influence there. If you want to learn more, you can go to HowStuffWorks.com and see the whole list of 10, or you can listen to our podcast, Stuff You Should Know, because we actually did a show on these 10 films that changed filmmaking. Let us know in the comments.